Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Ilan Debon about engaging and retaining young talent. Ilan Devon, welcome to the conversation today. Pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you. Where are you joining us from? Toronto, Canada. Wonderful. I'm joining us from south of Salt Lake City in Utah. Today, we're going to be talking about engaging and retaining young talent. I think there's a lot that gets packed into this kind of a conversation. So we're going to try to unpack this, explore this, uh, and try to better understand how organizations can better work with younger millennial and Gen Z workers today, but also moving into the future. As we get started, I wanted to share Ilan's bio with everybody. Ilan Devon is a Harvard-trained author, speaker, and founder of the Devon Academy, an organization that helps students and young professionals develop essential work life and leadership skills that companies want, but perhaps schools don't teach and technology is disrupted at a time when they are needed the most. Now, I could go on and, and share more about Devon, but I'm going to uh, pause there. Anything else you would like to highlight by way of your personal background or context or that of Devon Academy before we dive on in? I'll just say I am someone that is has been passionate for many, many years, decades now, in just in human potential and helping people mm-hmm. unleash potential. And so our focus, my focus and the focus of Devon Academy is on younger professionals who are living in an age where both growing up with screens and then the pandemic came along, they've just had it a more difficult time in developing a lot of skills, soft skills that today are really important for success in the workforce, but also for well-being. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is a very challenging time. The pandemic took a toll. I think for younger workers in particular, they're, you know, I, I can speak from just experience with my own family. Uh, I have two uh, daughters who are now college age who were completely disrupted during the pandemic, uh, during their late middle school or high school years. Uh, and it it took a toll and, and they were troopers and they came out of it, I think, overall better for it. But but in, in certain ways, you know, they were set back a bit and they had to really work at making sure that they were ready. And I think there were many uh, younger people who f- found themselves in similar um, circumstances and some who perhaps didn't have the support to, to make sure that they were coming out of it uh, prepared to be successful. Uh, so I think this is super important. It, it, well, it's always been important, but I think it's it particularly important right now, uh, given the recent context and the, the geopolitical, social, and economic landscape and like all the stuff that's going on that people are trying to deal with while navigating disruption in the workplace, new technologies that are shifting the way we do our work. All of that's happening simultaneously. And it's it's a hard time, I think, particularly for younger workers. Well, let's let's dive on in and talk about how we can go about engaging and retaining young talent. So it's an interesting time in the workforce. The labor market is tight. You know, there have been mass layoffs and tech firms and stuff, but d- despite that, there's still a tight labor market. It's still kind of a buyer's market. Um, organizations are struggling to find great talent, and that's been an issue for a while, particularly in STEM fields and healthcare and in in, in a variety of different uh, types of industries. And we have many generations in the workforce simultaneously. Uh, So you have baby boomers and Gen X, you have millennials, you have uh, Gen Z, and trying to figure out like how to help everyone cohesively work well together when they come from vastly different backgrounds and worldviews, different experiences uh, from a technological uh, standpoint, et cetera. Um, with all that kind of in mind as kind of the setting the stage for the current context, 
thoughts and ideas, tips for how we can engage and retain younger people, knowing that baby boomers are retiring. We need to you know, find people to, to lead the next generation of these organizations. Yeah, well, well, I think, you know, I'll start with the common denominator. I think for all generations, I think there's a famous saying, people go where they feel welcome, but they stay where they feel valued and appreciated. And obviously yeah. everybody wants to feel valued and appreciated. I think, so that goes across generations. I think with Gen Z and millennials, I think particularly Gen Z, the way they feel valued and appreciated is a little bit different or mm -hmm. the, the way that leads to that. <clears throat> and I think the key word for, uh, for Gen Z is, you know, it's flexibility. Yeah. But I think at the, at the number one thing they're looking for, which is for a number of reasons, but it, and it may not be surprising, is pay. <laughs> and this is because we have to understand the context in which Gen Z grew up. And also, of course, the context in which you're living today. So they grew just a generation, also millennials that grew up experiencing and living through the Great Recession when parents were losing jobs, when they had to leave homes, when they had siblings or older siblings coming home to live at home because they couldn't afford rent, uh, you know, elsewhere. So the Great Recession has really been imprinted on their psyche. They saw their, their, their parents uh, struggling financially. And they're saying to themselves, we don't want to have the same predicament. At the same time, they also saw their parents struggling and working so hard and being very stressed and yet still not getting the kind of life that necessarily they wanted. And so they're also saying to themselves, you know what? We're not going to kill ourselves over the, over, over the job. We want to also take care of our mental health and well-being. So pivot to today's time. And we know that, you know, how housing prices are where they're at, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, inflation, rising prices, et cetera. And so you have a generation that is looking for security, is looking for financial security, very hard to find it. One of the reasons why Gen Z is really keen on, and when they'll look at a, a job listing, for example, if it, if it doesn't say flexibility, 70, 80% of them will not even look at that job if there's no flexibility. And the reason for that, part of the reason for that is that when working and now they're everyone's used to hybrid work and they want hybrid work, although they do also want to come into an office. I want to, I think there's a lot of misconceptions that, you know, Gen Z are lazy or they don't want to work in the office. They do, they do value and want community, but they want the flexibility of being hybrid because it allows them to work and live in a place where it's more affordable. Mm -hmm. So the affordability factor is very important, not living, having to live right in the center of the city or next to the office, but living in a place where it's a little bit more affordable. Um, we also need to remember that Gen Z grew up, especially in the United States, at a time when they never experienced a moment of, of unity in mm -hmm. America. Obama to Trump, there's a lot of political polarization, a lot of instability. They've been through the Me Too movement and, and Black Lives Matter and, and you know, the, uh, the Arab Spring, and it's all been about revolution and change and the dissolution of old structures. So this is a generation that is both used to and seen what it's like to rebel against existing structures, yeah. but also looking for stability. So I think to just to bring it back to the simple question of how to retain and engage young talent is yes, we want to provide them with the stability and security of good pay. If we can't provide the kind of pay they're looking for, I think the next best thing is, uh, and, and the flexibility then, you want to provide them for opportunities and a horizon for gaining that kind of security, which means learning opportunities. You know, learning opportunities is absolutely critical for uh, Gen Z because they recognize that's the key for their yeah. professional growth, but also for their financial security. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well said. I want to uh, double click on a few of those points and, and dive into them a little bit deeper, but also first to highlight I, I, another way of kind of framing what you were just sharing in my mind is just this general degrading of in trust in institutions. So as we look at younger millennial and Gen Z in particular, uh, there is a tremendous amount of distrust in institutions, political institutions, economic institutions, organizations, companies, right? Um, and th I mean, there's a broader societal trend towards that, but it's particularly driven by, by younger people who, to your point, have experienced a lot of 
discord and 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 challenging times and it's and it's fundamentally different to be a young person today than it was when i was a kid versus when my parents were kids in terms of just the opportunity um, we often talk about the american dream for example and that's a really wonderful aspirational idea um but if it if it still exists it doesn't exist in the same way today for my kids as it did for my parents it just doesn't um yeah. housing prices uh, and, you know, wages have not kept up with inflation and housing prices. And it's just, it's just so much harder now for young people to get a leg up. Um, and not to say that my parents' generation didn't have to work hard. They did. Of course they did. But you can work really hard today and still not find your footing. And that, I think, is a big difference. Yeah, no, that, that's a really important point. The, the American dream, I was talking to my cousin in New York. He's 28, 29 years old. And he says to me, Elon, the, the American dream is no longer attainable for me in my generation because the idea of owning a home is so far removed from anyone that's just lacking. You know, if you don't have parents and a, and a, and the kind of support that and, and parents that can help you, put, you know, put down a large down payment on a home, there is no way for the average American, for example, or Canadian, or uh, European, or you know, anyone for that matter today yeah. to afford a home. Uh, in this, in this, in these conditions. So I think the whole dream is changing. I think, um, you know, also what people are looking for is changing. I think the the notion of having a career and it is no longer uh, tenable anymore. Either people aren't looking for careers; they're looking, and, and that's not the aspiration because you're not looking to climb the career ladder and 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 get to a certain position. I think we know we know from the statistics that. You know, people are going to have, young people will have 12, 15 jobs by the time they're 40, 45. And so, and they're also going to have to pivot and reinvent themselves because of disruption. I mean, the shelf life of skills today uh, is, of technical skills, is about two years. Meaning if you learn a technical skill, you know, the way things are moving in about two, two and a half years, you're going to have to learn a completely new skill because that skill will be redundant in, in two years from now. So I think this is changing what it means to have a career, what it means to work in an industry uh, and how young people are looking at the workforce. Uh, at the same time, their values are changing in terms of what they're, they're even looking for in life. I think, yeah. you know, folks are, young people aren't even looking to get married because and have kids because of the affordability factor as well. And so there's so many changes going on in terms of values, in terms of just financial realities that are changing the priorities of what young people look for in life and in the, in, in the job as well. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you mentioned this a few minutes ago. There's often this, I, I also view it as a misconception. You you framed it as a misconception. I, I know people will disagree with us, but when I hear um, folks talk about these young entitled millennial or Gen Z students or workers, I bristle at that um, because are, are there entitled folks? Of course there are. I mean, every generation has entitled people and people who are lazy and don't want to work. And, you know, th that's that's not unique to this younger generation, um, but they, they get labeled that way. And I think a, a big part, a, a big reason behind why they're getting labeled that way is, is to what you were just saying. Their priorities have shifted. Their values have shifted. So what would, may have been important to my parents' generation or even to my generation isn't necessarily important to them. They're also not willing to put up with maybe what we were willing to put up with. <laughs> you know, when I, I'm a university professor. I teach um, students how to run successful organizations. I teach them how to lead effectively. And they come out of my courses and out of my program knowing a better way. And they're not willing to go into the workforce and like, slog in a crappy job with a crappy boss for a crummy organization for 20 years, hoping that maybe someday they'll have their chance. Uh, there, there's just that the psychological contract of the workplace has shifted so dramatically that yes. there's there's really no horizon for that for most young people. They're not going to be staying in the same job or the same company for a long period of time. And so they want to go and they want it to be a good experience and they know it should be. They know people should know better and they're holding them accountable and then other workers who maybe put up with it and were willing to put up with it say, oh, well, you're entitled. You're not willing to pay your dues. I think that's silly. I think they're just holding organizations and leaders accountable for what they should have been doing all along. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you on that point. I think there is a lot of nuance here. So sure, sure. there yeah. are um, elements of the sort of the Gen Z or younger mindset that is just thinks differently. So I'll give you I, I'll yeah, yeah. this example uh, of dating. <laughs> okay. So, you know, in the past, when you and I were, we were going out, we, had to, we were looking for a partner, we just wanted to date someone. You went into, a, let's say, a bar or a restaurant, wherever it was, and you had to go up to somebody and you had to have an, probably an awkward conversation and be a little bit uncomfortable, maybe get rejected, work on your personality a bit to try and like charm the other person. And that's how you, you know, that was how dating worked. You know, in the past, you actually had to meet somebody. Today, because of apps, it's all, you know, obviously swipe, swipe this way or that. I guess what I'm getting at is that the tolerance of discomfort is lower. Yeah. by virtue of uh, because of technology and dating is just one example so you don't have to engage in difficult awkward conversations or step into discomfort i think the, the the notion of you know in some cases safe zones also on campus can be detrimental because the point i think of going to school is to is to be able to engage in difficult complex ideas that you don't necessarily agree with and to have difficult conversations i think life is all about learning to deal with discomfort because life can be uncomfortable even your dream job can be uncomfortable so i think that i guess all of this is to say that technology in the world young people are growing up in is just limiting their their opportunities to engage in discomfort because you have your easy you can easily sort of again swipe and just or just go someone if you don't want to talk to them anymore instead of having that conversation in the past, which would have been more not so comfortable. Uh, so I think it's a combination of, yes, there are shifting priorities and values, which is legitimate and I think is a good thing, but there's also a, a, a lowering of the bar when it comes to, for example, tolerance of stress and discomfort, which leads to heightened mental health issues as well, mm -hmm. because we have an inability to tolerate differences and everyone today is in their echo chambers look at the you know the politics for example everyone just listens to people that they agree with the moment someone disagrees with you it's either fight or flight you cannot just and, and you know it's more difficult engaging in these kinds of more difficult conversations yeah yeah and you you highlight a, a much bigger problem a, a societal kind of ill <laughs> that we need to figure out how to address because the art of of just having civil dialogue and civil debate has has largely vanished it seems un unfortunately and and certainly it can be hard for younger people but man I, I i see that at all levels you know trying to have conversations with people who disagree with you in my generation my parents generation their parents generation <laughs> it's a hard thing right now so it this this is something we need to you know that that's a, 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 a continued conversation i think for another day but great great points well devon I note the time. I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute. But before we wrap things up for today, I did want to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Uh, to find us, you visit us at, uh, you know, Devon Academy, which is www.devonacademy.com. Uh, we have, I mean, we're working today with, with companies. So we work with a lot of Fortune 500 companies and training their young talent and emerging talent and first-time managers, for example. But we also work with universities. In fact, Jonathan, we just uh, launched and just put together uh, a course, which is now being adopted by business schools across the United States for credit is being blended in as a for credit course to prepare students for the workforce and for success in the workforce. So this is a course that can be taken in schools, but it's also a course that you can take online through our website and just log on, find it on, on the uh, university solutions uh, uh, tab and, mm -hmm. and take this course if you're a student to prepare yourself for the workforce uh, as well and learn basically what we've packed into it are the six most in-demand skills that employers are looking for and professionals today must have to be successful, particularly in the age of disruption. Thank you, Devon. It has just been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, check out the Devon Academy. As always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.
Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe, and please join us again soon.